For those here this morning in the sanctuary, maybe you are listening on our radio station or online or you're watching the live stream. I want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel Grants Pass where we want to seek out the Lord. We want to go further by going deeper in his word, deeper in prayer, further out to spread the gospel. Here at Calvary, we read, we study the Bible, line upon line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Please turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts of the Holy Spirit, chapter 10. As you guys are finding that, the storm the last few days, um, the little car that I, I drive just too light, tires are bad, it just wouldn't go anywhere in the snow, and I got stuck up, uh, up on the mountain where I'm living. And uh, so I've been getting rides into the church, and finally uh, Dave said, oh, here's my car. And so he allowed me to, to borrow his, his four-wheel drive and been able to get up and down. And because I'm really here late, usually on Saturday night, uh, late, and then I get here very early Sunday morning, I figured, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to stay in town. So I just got a little hotel room and got down here about 9, 9.30, exhausted. So I went over there and I was just going to have a little bite to eat, take a hot bath and just crash out because I knew I'd be here at four in the morning, if not sooner. So the room I got, I, because I was one of the last, I guess, to get there, um, it was the last room on the hallway downstairs. So all night, all night, people kept going in and out, in and out, in and out. Not only that, right next were the washers and the dryers. So I'm hearing the washers and the dryers, and then the generator keep going on and on, people going in and out, and in and out. The whole first floor smelled intensely of weed. And so I'm thinking, and, and I'm like, oh gosh, I, so I'm going to take a hot bath. And I ended up paying a little bit extra because I wanted to get the big, huge bath with the jets. <laughs> so I turn it on, and, and it took about 15 minutes to fill up, and I keep going back. So uh, Finally, after about 15 minutes, it's all full. Yeah. I'm going to take a hot bath, and I'm just going to crash, get about four hours of sleep, get back here. I don't even think my, my, my feet touched the floor. I just jumped into it. Stone cold. Water was stone cold. So I get up. So I go to lay down. And you know when you have to get up early in the morning, you start thinking, oh, I got to get up, I get up, right? And then for some reason, earlier in the day, I was reading about cell phones, and one of the things that were happening with the cell phones, the alarm wasn't going off. So I kept thinking, okay, my phone's not going to go off. My phone's not going to go off. And what I should have done is just call and said, give me a wake-up call. But I didn't. McFly. So every 15 minutes, I'm like looking at the clock. Look. So basically, I think I got about 15 minutes of sleep. But God is in control. And the reason why is when I went and I checked out at about 3.45 this morning, I got to talk to someone at the desk. And I didn't plan this. I wanted to be out by 10, sleep four or five hours, boom. God had a different plan. See, God knew where I was. He knew where that individual at the front desk, where that person was going to be. God sets up divine meetings. Here in Acts chapter 10, divine meetings. Verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Verse 3, Above the ninth, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, Verse 4, and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms 
have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter, verse 6. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. Verse 7. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called out two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. Verse 8. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord. I just thank you that you are in control. And you know what is going on everywhere. And that we can trust in you. I just pray by your Holy Spirit that you speak to each one of us here. Prick our heart. Touch us in the name of your son. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Acts 10. It tells a story that is one of the great turning points in the history of the church. The church started in Jerusalem. But because of the persecution happening there in Jerusalem, many of the believers, most of them, Scattered, Scripture says, everywhere. And when they scattered, they took the gospel with them, preaching the gospel. The gospel was on the move, and the Holy Spirit was drawing Jews to Jesus. They were seeing Christ, Jesus, as who he really was, the Messiah. Philip, the deacon, He took the gospel to Samaria. And scripture says, many believed. Also, Ethiopia was open to the gospel by Philip preaching to the high officer of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. Through Philip, through the converted Saul, and through Peter and John and the rest of the apostles, the word of God, it was being spread, preached in Damascus, Judea, Caesarea, Galilee, Tarsus, and all of the surrounding towns. Thousands of dispersed Jews were coming to Christ. Just as they are today. But here in chapter 10, for the first time, a Gentile is to be admitted into the fellowship. Now some of you may be going, wait, what about the Samaritans? Well, if you remember the Samaritans, they were half Jewish, half Jewish, mixed blood. And the church was still Jewish in character, but the doors of the church were about to be formally open wide to all Jews and Gentiles. Verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. Since Cornelius is so important in church history, let's get a little background on what we know about him, what scripture tells us, who he was, his makeup, his character. In this first verse, there's a lot of info that needs to be understood, needs to be unpacked, explained. Words, Caesarea, centurion. Regiment, Italian regiment, and Cornelius. We'll discuss in that order. Caesarea, not to be confused with Caesarea Philippi, which is about 150 miles inland of Jerusalem, but in the Caesarea, which is on the Mediterranean coast, it's about 65 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Back in the day, it was a bustling city, a lot going on. Pontius Pilate, who condemned Jesus. He lived there in the governor's palace during his tenure. Archaeologists have discovered a stone from a building in Caesarea inscribed with the name Pontius Pilate. Philip, the deacon, the evangelist, he was from this city. It was the political capital, the military headquarters, and commercial center for Judea under the Romans. The word centurion. It means officer of the Roman military, captain of 100 plus 
men. But it goes deeper, deeper than that. What did it mean really to be a centurion in the Roman army? Let's start with responsibility. By looking at responsibility, we can determine character. Regiment. The Greek word is spira, cohort, battalion, legion. In dissecting the Roman military into groups, there was first a legion. This force evolved from 3,000 men in the Roman Republic to 6,000 in the Roman Empire. Every legion was divided into multiple cohorts. The cohort was divided into centuries, and over each century or platoon was a centurion. A centurion's importance was based on seniority, with the senior centurion in the legion being in a position of great prestige. Some historians have compared the top-level centurions to medieval knights. Centurions represented the bridge between enlisted troops and commissioned officers in much the same way as warrant officers do in our modern U.S. military. Soldiers were appointed as centurions by virtue of their bravery, their loyalty, character, and prowess in battle. They were held to high standards of conduct, and they were expected to fight on the front lines with their men. In fact, the centurion's designated place in formation was at the end of the very first row. As a result, they experienced high rates of injury and death during war. The centurions were well paid, held in high esteem. The combination of wealth, power, and prestige made them influential in society and the backbone of the Roman army. One ancient historian describes the qualifications of the centurions as this. Centurions are desired not to be overbold and reckless, so much as good leaders of steady and prudent mind, not prone to take the offensive to start fighting wantonly, but able, when overwhelmed and hard-pressed, to stand fast and die at their post. Cornelius, therefore, was a man who first and foremost, he knew what courage, loyalty were. God was brave, of good standard and reputation. He was trusted by superiors and respected and loved by those under his command. Italian regiment, Italian, a cohort of soldiers from Italy, not local or provincial soldiers. There were 32 Italian regiments stationed in the different regions of the empire. They were made up of only Italian soldiers and were considered the most loyal Roman troops. A large part of the Roman military by mid-empire was made up of armies of volunteers, subjects of areas that the, the Romans had conquered. Volunteer or Auxiliary soldiers were rewarded after their term of service with Roman citizenship. They were given citizenship and also a very large final cash payment. But the Italian regiment, these were the real deal. Incidentally, it was the Italian regiment who dealt with Jesus. These guys were hardened. Battle, soldiers, lifelong soldiers, lifelong, they were in it, trained in Rome, the real deal. It's interesting to me that the first Gentile, Jesus had dealings in his public ministry, was a Roman centurion whose faith he, Jesus, commended and in whose faith he saw the beginning of the flow of the great Gentile tide into the new kingdom of God. You can read about that conversation that Jesus has with this centurion in Matthew chapter 8 or Luke chapter 7. 
And verse 1 says, Cornelius was a centurion of the Italian regiment. Verse 2, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. So this verse gives us a little bit more info into Cornelius' personal life. His character, Cornelius, a battle-tested, respected soldier, was also devout. The meaning of devout, pious, dutiful, God-fearing. As a typical Roman, he would have been exposed to all of the Roman mythical gods, Jupiter, Augustus, Mars, Venus, but found they paled in comparison to the reality of the God of Judaism. Cornelius, he was a God-fearer. In New Testament times, this had become almost a technical term for Gentiles who were weary of the gods and the immoralities of their ancestral faiths. These God-fearing individuals, they had attached themselves to the Jewish religion. Now, they didn't accept circumcision or the law, but they attended the synagogues. They attended the synagogues. And they believed in the one true God, Jehovah, Yahweh. We, we should be God-fearers in the truest sense. Aaron went over this last Sunday night perfectly. For the unbeliever, the fear of God is the fear of the judgment of God and eternal death, which is eternal separation from God. You see, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have not surrendered your life to God, your sin, it hasn't been dealt with. And all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And because you sin, hey, you're unholy. And nothing unholy can have communion, can have fellowship with a holy God but because God is love. Because God is love, he sent his son, Jesus, to save you. By dying for your sin, taking the wrath which was due to you. But the kicker is, you need to accept that gift from God, his son, Jesus. You need to accept him as your savior, If you don't, your sin is not dealt with, with here on earth. And if you were to die, and your sin is not dealt with here on earth, it's going to be dealt with in heaven, the eternal realm. And what that means is eternal damnation for those who have not accepted Jesus. See, people look at Jesus and they say, oh, so if I don't believe in Jesus, you're telling me that your God's going to send me to hell? No, your sin sends you to hell. My sin sends me to hell. Jesus is the vehicle, the mechanism, the get out of hell free card. That if I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, hey, he takes those sins and washes them away. I'm made clean. Jesus is what saves us. Bless you from hell. But for the believer, the fear of God is something much, much different. The believer's fear is reverence of God, reverence of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. This reverence and awe is exactly what the fear of God means for Christians. It is the motivating factor for us to surrender to the creator of the universe. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 declares, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A biblical fear of God for the believer includes understanding how much God hates sin. He hates sin. Why? Because it separates us from him. 
and fearing his judgment on sin. See, even as believers, we need to deal with our sin. And until we understand who God is and develop that reverence of him, we cannot have true wisdom. True wisdom comes only from understanding who God is and that he is holy, he is just, he is righteous. Cornelius feared God. He was also a man given to charity, the verse says. He gave generously. God loves a cheerful giver. I remember when I was a little kid and my mom was trying to explain to me giving to the church. I think at the time I, I don't know, got 50 cents or whatever a week. And so I had saved up two bucks. And uh, she was trying to teach me tithing. So I took out one of those dollars and she grabs it. I'm not letting go. <laughs> I wouldn't let go. And she just said, keep it. If you're going to be that way, God doesn't need your money. See, she was trying to teach me that we should give to God because he gives so much to us. So I kept it. A couple of weeks later, I gave it though. <laughs> Cornelius, he was kind. And his search for God had instilled in his heart to be kind to those less fortunate. Alms, generously. And his family feared God. This hardened soldier brought his family to faith in God, not in the pagan gods of Greece or Rome, but the true God. It says in this verse, he was also a man of prayer, prayed to God always, a man of prayer. He may as yet not clearly known the God to whom he prayed to. And he might not have known Christ, yet he feared God. And though he didn't know the Holy Spirit, yet the Holy Spirit knew him and wrote down in Scripture that he was devout, God-fearing, generous. Cornelius lived up to the light that he'd been given when more light was given, he would respond. See, he sought out God. He sought out God. Do we search out God? Let's be honest. Do we really search out God? He sought out God. Do we just squeeze God into wherever we can find five minutes here, seven minutes there in our busy schedule? Do we seek out God? Cornelius, he sought out God. And as he sought out God, God found him. Verse 3. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. The ninth hour translates into 3 p.m., customary time of prayer for the Jews. Now, it's interesting that the ninth hour was the very hour that Jesus died. It was the evening sacrifice in public prayer in the temple. This verse, he saw clearly in a vision. This was a vision that came in the mind's eye of Cornelius, but it was so vivid to him that Cornelius would later say in the chapter that he saw a man beside him in bright clothing. To him, it was real. And he was called by name. Cornelius, that would get my attention. <laughs> God knows. He knows your name. He knows your name. He knows all about you, what you're going through, the heartache, the pain, your doubts, your suffering, your struggles. Nothing catches God unaware. And he cares. God cares. He loves you. Peter would later write in his first epistle, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. God loves us. God loves us, and he wants us to have an intimate relationship with him. 
It's just we need to want that too. We need to surrender. We need to seek out God like Cornelius did. Verse 4. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. The appearance of the angel frightened the seasoned Roman veteran. But his alarm was immediately stilled. See, the angel knew him. And he told him that his prayers and alms had ascended to God. Like the fragrance of the Hebrew burnt offering. The burnt offering is one of the oldest and most common offerings in Jewish history. God ordered Abraham to offer up his son Isaac in a burnt offering. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 22. And then God provided a ram as a replacement. See, he was just testing Abraham. And he showed Abraham that he was faithful. The Hebrew word for burnt offering actually means to ascend. Literally means to go up in smoke. See, the smoke from the sacrifice ascended to God. And it was a sweet, soothing aroma to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 1 verse 9 reads, But he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar as a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. A burnt offering was the complete destruction of the animal, except for the hide. In an effort to renew the relationship between a holy God and a sinful man. It was a memorial unto God. God knew and saw Cornelius's faith. He saw his devotion and effort to know him. God sees when we have faith and when we diligently seek him. And he honors, answers those who do. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Got to believe. Got to have faith. He rewards. Verse 5. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. The Lord knew all about Peter. The angel was about to give Cornelius exact instructions on where to find. Peter, God never forgets a name, never loses an address, never makes a mistake, never has a moment's hesitation in knowing where we are. God knows. God knows where I am right now. I have to admit, I put in this picture because I love the car. (laughs) There is... Something comforting in that. That he who tracks the journeys of 100 billion stars in each of the 100 million galaxies, he who knows the path, the history, and the destiny of every speck of dust in cosmic space, he knows. He knows all about me and you. And he cares. He cares. In the book of Acts, it is so interesting to see how God keeps track of men, how he sets up these divine meetings. As I'm going through this, it's like, wow, wow. God does that today. That meeting this morning... That was a divine meeting with that individual. I sure didn't plan on talking to anyone. God knew. God knew. It's interesting in the book of Acts to see how God keeps track of men. Does God need a man to meet an Ethiopian traveling at high speed away from Jerusalem with a great longing searching in his soul? God knows where 
Philip is. Philip, go find this guy. Does God need a man to find blind Saul of Tarsus on the street called Straight? God knows where Ananias lives. Ananias, got something for you to do. Does God need a man to give the gospel to a good but still unregenerate Roman centurion? God knows where Peter is temporarily staying. He knows. So God gives Cornelius Pete's temp address. Go, send for him, and he, he will tell you what to do. God has not given the ministry of reconciliation to angels. No, the work of the gospel has been entrusted to men. You and I. How many missionaries are in here right now? Full. We are called to serve God. World evangelism may be slower this way, but it is sweeter. The testimony of a believer, it has special weight, credence. Only man can say, I was once lost like you. But one day, Jesus found me and saved me. God saved me. No angel can talk like that. If a man had a choice to go hear one of God's saints preach or to go and hear an angel preach, Cornelius could tell them what to do. He would say, go and hear the man. I've heard an angel, and he told me to go find Peter. Send for Peter. He told me exactly where he would be. Cornelius, centurion. Peter, the apostle. Simon, the tanner. Joppa is about 33 miles from Caesarea. And Cornelius, he was to find Peter with Simon, a tanner. A tanner. A man occupied all day with the skins of dead animals. His job was to work with dead things. I want you to understand, to touch a dead body of any kind was to render a Jew Ceremonially unclean. A tanner was therefore socially shunned, despised in the Jewish community. Yet, the fact that Peter stayed with him showed that Peter was being led, being led by the Holy Spirit. Cornelius probably didn't know Peter, but he knew he should do what God had instructed him to do. When we hear God's voice, and I have to admit, it's never a big, Troy! Small little voice. All of a sudden, hey, go talk to that person. Pray for this person. You should go do this. That's, That's just God speaking to us, the Holy Spirit moving us small little voice. When we hear God's voice, when we feel that God is speaking to us, we need to obey. And we need to act like Cornelius. Verse 7. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. Verse 8. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Two servants and a soldier were selected at once and briefed on their mission. And the word used to describe the way Cornelius explained or communicated his experience, it is a very interesting word. The word is exagema in the Greek. It is where we get our word Exegesis, which that means known by expounding. It is the same word used by John in his gospel, chapter 1, verse 18, to describe the Lord's mission on earth. Let me read the verse. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared, or exagema, him. In other words, Jesus expounding, testifying 
telling us of God the Father in heaven to mankind. Jesus came to testify. Cornelius, he took special care to make known to his messengers exactly what had happened and why Peter was needed. Cornelius would have been familiar with Jewish prejudices against social contact, even with God-fearing Gentiles. Jews, for the most part, they shunned Gentiles. Cornelius appreciated the need for making the extraordinary circumstances clear and plain of what happened to him. The prompt action of Cornelius was in character both with the men he chose and the solemn experience he had just had. Scripture tells us that Cornelius, he was generous, God-fearing, and he shared his faith with those close to him. And how he lived his life devout caused his household and some of those under his command to also believe his faith of and in God. It was contagious. It spread to those that he had contact with. Don't ever think that how you live your life for God doesn't matter. It does. People see, people notice. What we do for God does matter. Our lives should show our faith in Christ. How we live our lives should show our beliefs. And people around us, they notice. They see. And what's even more important, God sees. Always. God sees always. There is nothing hidden with God. And we matter to God. We matter. Scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, that God created us in his own image. His own image. How amazing is that to think that we are literally created in the image of God. Just as fathers and mothers are overwhelmed with love as they look at their own children, God is filled with divine and perfect love when he looks at us. I find comfort in knowing that my all-powerful heavenly Father looks over me the way that parents lovingly look over their children. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 tells me, the Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. <laughs> when something exciting happens in my life, I want to share it with other believers. What God has done so that we can rejoice together. I know that my Savior, Jesus Christ, is near me. That he fights for me. He saves me. Rejoices over me. And when I weep, He will quiet me. He will calm me. And he will sing over me with love. Oh, how I want to hear his voice sing. His love. He is love. He loves us greatly. And for those who believe in his name, the name of Jesus, nothing will separate us from him. He promises that. Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, it is only through faith 
in Jesus that one enters into the kingdom of heaven. There is no other door. There is no other way. There is no other Savior. Only Jesus. All roads do lead to heaven, but for judgment. To get into the kingdom of heaven, to see the kingdom of God, you've got to give your life to Jesus. You have to surrender. See, by surrendering, we are victorious. Victorious. Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. He paid the price. He is the saving Christ. Are you willing to be saved this morning? Father in heaven, we come before you. And I just thank you, Lord, just for your love for us, that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. And Jesus, that you willingly came down off of your throne here. And you lived a perfect life. And you died in an excruciating, horrible death so that we could live for those who believe in your name. I thank you, Jesus, that you willingly obeyed and the love that you have for us. No one is guaranteed tomorrow. Scripture tells us that. Salvation is today. And I would be remiss since I have this pulpit to not ask, is there anyone who would like to give their life to Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the only one who could save you from hell? God loves us so much that he sent his son. Anyone. Maybe you're listening or watching. Lift up your hand. God, God will see it. God knows. He knows exactly where you are. He knows what you're going through. Amen. amen. Actually, I was saying amen to a couple of people who raised their hands, but amen. God is good. <laughs> I guess that prayer is done with. <laughs> Got to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. That's good. <laughs> As always, if anyone has any reason to come up for, for prayer, for anything, for any reason, please come on up. We'll have pastors and their wives up here. Do not leave here without doing business. God bless. <laughs>